Salaam from the People's Dispatch Studios in New Delhi. This is Dispatches from India, where we talk about the burning issues from the world's largest democracy and the impact they have on the country's economy, polity and society. We begin this show today with the second anniversary of the All India Lockdown for the COVID-19 pandemic. On the 24th of March 2020, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced this nationwide lockdown and over the following weeks and months threw the whole nation into chaos. The worst hit were of course the working class, especially migrants. Despite some in the government claiming there was no data, uh, the impact was there for all to see. Thousands of migrants were forced to flee big cities and many walked hundreds of kilometres to reach their homes. For the unluckiest, death lay at the end of those highways. Newsclicks Pragya Singh recounts the horrors of India's first COVID lockdown. So the Indian government basically announced a national lockdown on March 27, 2020. That was when COVID was just beginning to spread. They were around just 20 deaths by then due to COVID. So that lockdown was very sudden and total and it had a terrible impact on the economy and on income immediately when sources of income dried up all of a sudden people basically started walking home. There was a massive reverse migration of workers from cities to villages and thousands of, uh, there were actually thousands of people who were, who had started walking home. Some were walking for several hundred kilometers because suddenly the buses and the trains had also stopped running. Uh, very often we found that ordinary people were standing by the highways and trying to assist these returning workers. Then, since the lockdown was announced at just four hours' notice, there was uh, immediate shortages in food and also in other supplies. The rules were so uh, flexible, they were constantly changed, so that the movement of essential goods itself became a maze for people to, uh, which people found impossible to navigate. For example, you had relief camps coming up, but then how can people who need to access those relief camps get there when there's no working transport? In fact, there were many state governments which actually welcomed the lockdown, but when it came down to the action, they were faring very badly in helping people during that time. People had to register at the state level if they wanted to get help from the government, especially the workers, but the process was confusing or you needed biometrics or the schemes were simply not designed for those circumstances of a lockdown. Uh, we, uh, the end result was that we saw the prices zooming up and the supplies of many items kept falling. There were long wait times for basic things which you need at the time like sanitizer, uh, important medicines, your, your masks and especially in smaller towns and villages. For the underprivileged basically it was a pretty big disaster. There were reports of people who had not been able to access food. There were some reports that people died due to lack of food, but all the governments basically denied this. Indeed, the government had promised to help um, all those who were stranded and even the migrant workers, but those who thought it possible decided to walk home. And if you really look at the reasons why this would have happened, it's, it's probably because they did not believe that the government would be able to help them. Um, then those who had managed to walk home found it, it, their trouble didn't end there. They found that the most of the state governments where they belonged to were ill-prepared to meet them. Uh, so the government, by then the government at the center, many states had essentially handed over the management of the pandemic to the police. And the police was beating up people who violated the strict lo lockdown. Uh, we saw many high-handed tactics, especially at the state borders, when the tired and hungry workers were basically stopped and told they wouldn't be able to go ahead. Uh, maybe some people would argue that India's was the strictest lockdown in the world, etc. But actually, though nothing was moving in that time, actually it was a time when the resilience of the underprivileged was put to kind of very cruel test. And at least 200 people died in that walk home, which is probably an underestimation. The lockdown was also symbolic of the government's overall management of the pandemic. Top heavy, law and order centric and focusing on messaging. Prabir Prakayastha, who has been studying the epidemic since day one, talks about the early approach of the government. This is two years when the first lockdown was imposed during the COVID pandemic in India. Now, we have a lot to learn from, it, from this and also a lot to unlearn from what happened. First is 
Why did India impose a lockdown of this magnitude? In fact, it was one of the most draconian lockdowns imposed anywhere at the time. And it is not in consonance with the numbers that we were seeing. In fact, the numbers were rather low at that time. And if we look on it today, it was certainly a mistake to use a, a All India lockdown at a time when the pandemic had really just started in India. And that also in a few of the uh, well connected internationally those places. So you would have some in Kerala, some in Mumbai, some in Delhi and Punjab. So it was really, the numbers were very low. To lock down the entire country was a huge mistake, which is what epidemiologists and health, public health experts said later, that you locked India down at a time when there was no need to, to impose an all India lockdown of this nature. You also lock down without any preparations and the entire burden of this lockdown was borne by the migrant population. Those people who have come from the rural areas and who work in cities, it's wrong to call them migrant really in that sense because they do work in the cities and they go back only occasionally to their homes. Their real workplace is our today urban India. Now this population suddenly were basically into various kinds of casual work as it is called, had to leave the urban areas because they had no access to income, they had no access to food and they had no other support. So they actually lay, lay, left and when they left they were treated very badly because they were treated as if they were criminals fleeing the, you know, from their place of work. Well actually there was no work and there was no support for them. So this was a huge dislocation that took place and it was quite gratuitous because the numbers that went up, went up a lot later, even in the urban areas. And as I said, that the numbers, if you see at the beginning of the lockdown, at the end of the lockdown, you will see numbers at the end of the lockdown was much higher than the beginning of the lockdown. So it served no health purpose, public health purpose. Five Indian states went to the polls in Feb and March 2022. In the run-up to these elections, state-owned oil companies such as Indian Oil, HPCL and BPCL froze retail prices of both petrol and diesel for a record 137 days. Now that the elections are over, in which the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party dominated, the hiatus on uh, revisions of oil prices has ended. There were four hikes of eight-tenths of a rupee each in the five days starting from March 22nd a trend that's likely to continue with international crude oil prices in the $100 to $120 uh, range per barrel. Industry watchers say India's oil companies have lost over $2 billion since November last year and, at current crude rates, will need to hike prices by as much as 25 rupees a litre for diesel if they want to pass the entire load down to the customer. We spoke to Paranjoy Guha Thakurta to get a better sense of this dance between politics and market economics. I am Paranjoy Guha Thakurta in Gurugram near Delhi, the capital of India. On Saturday, the 26th of March, 2022, for the fourth time in five days, oil marketing and distribution companies in India increased the prices of the two most commonly used petroleum products, namely, petrol or motor spirit and diesel. Behind the increase for the fourth time in five days lies an interesting story. These oil marketing companies are mainly owned by the government of India, if not owned, certainly controlled by the government of India. On the 4th of November, in the run-up to elections, in five states or provinces in India, these oil marketing companies froze prices. Prices didn't go up. Then, after the elections to the legislative assemblies of Uttar Pradesh, which is India's most populous state, Punjab, which is one of India's most agriculturally prosperous states, not to mention smaller states like Uttarakhand, Goa and Manipur, after elections were completed 
and the results were declared on the 10th of March. 12 days later, the prices started going up. The prices were kept on hold for four and a half months. And during this period, international prices of crude oil shot up from roughly $82 a barrel to around $117 a barrel. There were various reasons for the increase in the international prices of crude, crude oil. The most important one being the, the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Now, international prices of crude oil are very, very, very important. Very simple reason. India, in the recent past, in the last few years, has been importing between 85 and 90 percent of the country's total requirement of crude oils. That means India is producing domestically between 10 and 15 percent of our total requirements. And this includes the, the petroleum crude oil, which is imported to India, refined and then exported. But the short point is that this four and a half month long freeze in the prices of the retail prices of petrol, diesel and other petroleum products has resulted in these oil marketing companies, which, as I mentioned earlier, are mainly controlled by the government of India. It resulted in, in them losing 2.25, two and a quarter billion, billion US dollars. So even after these four increases in the prices, the retail prices, the prices available at the pump, there's every likelihood that prices will go up again. And these not include not just the prices of, of, um, of uh, petrol and diesel, which are used largely in the automotive sector, also to some extent for power generation, but also petroleum products like LPG or liquefied petroleum gas or cooking gas. So the prices of all these products, all the, the, the increase in the prices of all these uh, petroleum products, which have been kept on hold because of political reasons, have had an important, is one of the important contributory factors to the rise of inflation in India and the rise in prices of a wide range of commodities because these are used for transportation and therefore are an intermediary which results in the prices of other products going up. And finally, ugly scenes are playing out in movie halls in India during and around the screening of a film called The Kashmir Files. The film claims to tell the story of Kashmiri Pandits, an upper caste Hindu group who were forced into exile in 1990. However, the film and its director have been criticized for blatant disregard of facts and for using the film to promote an anti-Muslim narrative. The film has been strongly backed by the ruling BJP, with several states giving it tax exemptions. Journalist Anandya Chakravarti deciphers the model of propaganda in our times. Kashmir Files has generated an intense divisive debate across the country. Its filmmakers and those who support it say that it's an eye-opener which tells the tale of the genocide, the alleged genocide of Kashmiri Pandits that took place more than 32 years ago and that uh, it had been pushed under the carpet, neglected by successive governments till the coming of this government which has raised the issue again. Those who criticize this film say that it's a thinly veiled piece of propaganda and it has been used essentially to target one particular community and to generate communal polarization. And whatever the filmmakers might have intended to do, and one can give them the benefit of the doubt, it is without any doubt that it has resulted in intense communal passions. Uh, we have seen across the internet videos being shared of uh, people giving communally charged hate speeches in theatres where the film was uh, screened and that these videos are being shared on social media by politicians and also on WhatsApp groups across India causing deep-seated anxieties, resentment and bubbling over of hatred. So whether the filmmakers like it or not, there is no doubt that it is working as a propaganda film. But the question is, why do people believe in propaganda? Why do they accept disinformation 
and believe it. Now, propaganda has become an absolutely uh, easy tool in the hands of those in power and those who control the economy, which is corporates, with the spread of social media, with the decline of old forms of knowledge, whether it's books, whether it is articles, newspapers, where a certain form of debate could take place. Today, social media, easy news bites, a few text, photographs, pictures, memes, they dominate public discourse, they dominate messaging. And it is very easy to control this with control over money and to spread it. As existing old forms of political mobilization have become weaker, as reaching people through social media, through national mainstream media has slowly replaced the old system of uh, workers, party workers going and campaigning, the ability to control messaging, political messaging and corporate messaging has become much more easy and it's an easier tool today in the hands of those in power. That means for democracy to survive, you have to question power. Everyone needs to ask questions. Without that, you will be a victim of propaganda and you will be a carrier of propaganda. You will never question, you will believe whatever is being fed to you. That's all we have on dispatches from India for today. For more on all of these stories, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org and give us a follow on all the regular social media platforms. We'll be back next week. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.